people and possibly about yourself than you have ever heard before in business. The reason? The better you understand your customer and yourself, the better you can serve both. And only you can make the difference. There are two things we have to take care of before we start for little bits of business. Uh, the first one is so many of you have asked, Leo, would you tell us how to pronounce your name? And you know, I don't blame you. If you've seen my name in writing, you never attempt it. It's spelled B-U-S-C-A-G-L-I-A, and it's pronounced like everything in the world. And I love telling stories about it, which I'd like to tell you just a one or two. But the one that I love the best is making a long-distance telephone call and the line being busy and the operator saying to me she'd call me back just as soon as the line was free. And when the phone rang, I picked it up and she said, would you tell Dr. Boxcar that his telephone call is through? I said, could that be Buscaglia? She said, sir, it could be damn near anything. <laughs> My name is Felice Leonardo Buscaglia, and I love it, but you can call me anything you like. That's order business number one. Order business number two. I had a really crazy, wonderful, magical Im immigrant mama who was very large, who laughed a lot, and who believed in many, many things. And she influenced my life in so many ways. And she taught us about the value of laughter and the value of joy. So our house was always full of laughter. And so another thing she said is every time you get before an audience, always try to dress nicely, Felice. Put a tie on, put a jacket, because it shows that you respect them. And you know, I, I really can't work with a jacket and a tie, but I want you to know, you to know that I respect you. And now that you know it, I'm going to take them off, and then we can get working, okay? That's order business number two, and now we can go ahead. <clears throat> I wanted to meet the sales managers and salesmen to whom I would be speaking. And the thing that I feel we have in common more than anything else is the fact that all of us are in people-oriented professions. When you really think about it, that I as a teacher... I'm in the process of selling knowledge. You're in the process of selling what you consider to be equally and fully important. And, but the thing that we're selling is not the object, but we're selling people. And when we lose sight of that, we've missed. We've missed the boat. It's people that are the essence. And so I'm not here to talk to you about how to sell. You're the experts in selling. But I have an expertise just beginning. Actually, I've been working for 30 years on trying to understand the magic and the mystery of human behavior. What makes people act the way they do? What makes them respond? What turns them on? What gets them excited? And, uh, and uh, at, the, uh, at the other side, what puts them down? What causes them to walk away? What causes them to reject? And about that, no one is an expert. And, you know, basically, I found out that in terms of having to communicate with people, probably the most, the greatest deterrent is the fact that so many of us devalue ourselves. We don't believe in ourselves. We don't trust ourselves. You know, I did a, a study year after year after year in my psych classes uh, with my young students, and I asked them a simple question. If you could be anybody in the world, whom would you select to be right now? Do you know that over 80% would pre prefer being somebody else? Well, let me remind you that you're all that you have. And until you get to the point that you can recognize that, appreciate it, you'll never convince anybody else that you have any worth. So it all starts with you. And you can only give to others and convince others to the extent that you have and you're convinced about yourself. The magic of working with people is that we've never been able to discover an end to human potential. You can call yourself the expert in the sales field. If you're wise, you'll know you're only just beginning. There is so much more to learn. So we can't afford to go to bed at night the same way that we awoke in the morning. We've got to say, how am I bigger? How am I better? How am I more? Eliad Weissel wrote a beautiful book called Souls on Fire that I highly recommend. Very touching, incredible book. Makes a statement that when we die and we go to meet our maker, we're not going to be asked why we didn't become a Muslim Messiah or why we didn't find a cure for cancer or why we didn't change the, change the course of human history. The only thing that we're going to be asked is, why didn't you become fully you? 
when I gave you all of the possibilities to become so much, why did you settle for so little? And you know, it really bothers me as an educator that people are willing to die without being fully born. And I keep reminding them there's more, there's more, there's more. You know, the world is built of incredible things that other people have said it's not possible of. Don't you believe it? Anything you can dream, can dream by the very nature that you can dream it makes it possible. But I still hear it's not possible. Or that's the way it is and it can't be changed. Anything can be changed if you dedicate yourself to the process. I can't do anything about it. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. And things like I... You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Don't you love that one? That's an insult even to an old dog. I've taught all kinds of tricks to old dogs. Don't you believe it and don't fall in those traps. So many of us believe that everything has to go our way. We define a good day by how happy we have been rather than how happy we've made others. I remember being trapped in the airport in Chicago. Uh, we were snowed in. I'm sure many of you have had that experience at O'Hare. And I was sitting there in the airport. I, I, when, I, when those things happen and there's nothing you can do about it, so I get ulcers. You know, I, have, I still have not learned how to change the weather. And so I sit down and I say, okay, so here I am. Now, how can I make the best of this situation? And there was a man there screaming at this poor hostess and saying, I want to get to Cleveland. I've got to get to Cleveland. Please, you can see on her face, boy, would I like you to get to Cleveland. <laughs> Fast, you know. Here he was screaming and screaming. And here was a woman, she must have been in her 70s, who decided that she was going to go around and collect up all the little kids. Uh, with mamas that were traveling with children and we leave mama to go to the bathroom to get something to eat because they, by the way, they announced that we could eat wherever we wanted to we could have all there was to drink you know, this is heaven what is he screaming about? well, this woman went around and she was saying to different women you know, I, I was a kindergarten teacher and I can sit down with your kids and you don't worry about it because I'm going to tell them so here was this one woman over here being a kindergarten teacher and helping others. And here was this man whose voice was resounding all over the airport, screaming and yelling. Now, what's the difference between those two? An understanding that the world was not made for you. I mentioned to several people today that I had the opportunity to talk to the Dalai Lama of Tibet, and it was a beautiful experience. But the one thing that was the most essential that he taught me was he said the purpose of life is to help others. And then he, then he smiled slightly and he said, And if you can't help them, would you at least not hurt them? And then another thing we've got to get back to, it seems to me that we are a very, very serious oriented society. We are so serious. Everything is serious. I say we need to be a little mad again. Get in touch with our madness. I'm not saying go, in, go out and use your craziness to abuse, but rather to lighten things up, to make people laugh. But you know, if you look up the, up the dictionary definition of madness, you know what it says, among other things? It, sa it says ecstasy. And it says, it says enthusiasm. And those are the things about madness that I'd like us to get in touch with again, so that we can laugh and get away from routines. You know, most of us are bored because we are locked into routines. Think about it. You go to work the same day, the same way every day. You go from this point to this point. You get out, you do the same thing. You pour the same coffee. You say hello to the same person. You know, just one day, will you do it all backwards? Just see what happens. Find a new route to work. In fact, find a new route every day. And instead of getting up in the morning and getting up on the right side of the bed, get up on the left side. Roll over your wife. He says, what are you doing? You say, I'm changing my life. <laughs> it may be the most important morning of your life. But really, you know, real madness comes from that kind of routine where you will fall into dullness. Because you're doing the same thing all the time in the same way. And there's no need to. We can, a society has us behaving like robots. Think about it. You don't make those decisions. You do these things automatically. Elevator behavior is a perfect classic. Isn't it amazing? Whoever told you to face straight front in an elevator? And yet the door opens and there are nine zombies standing like this. 
stuff, you know. And don't you dare look at anybody or talk to anybody. Or heaven forbid, touch somebody in an elevator. You're sitting there watching the numbers. 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, you know. And I, I just love to walk in an elevator. And I face this way. I say, hi. I, wouldn't it be nice if the elevator got stuck and we could all get to know each other? You know, third floor, mass exodus. Everybody leaves. There's a lunatic in the elevator. He wants to know me. You know, what a pity. We're so estranged from each other that we're intimidated by this nonsense. Somebody has told us to behave this way. But you know, you can alone bring magic to the people you encounter. Bring surprise. Bring humor. Bring joy. It doesn't have to be a drag. It doesn't have to be done the same way all the time. I knew an exciting way to meet people, to convince people, to talk to people, to be joyous with people. For goodness sakes, why are we dying of boredom? And when you are magic and you're carrying around that magic, you create that magic wherever you are and that excitement for life. No dead person has ever taught life, for sure. You've got to be alive yourself. And that brings us to another thing that I talked about earlier that is important, and that is that we come to terms with death. You know, Sigmund Freud said that one of the basis of neuroses was the fact that all of us think that we are immortal and we're going to live forever, and that we're constantly putting things off for tomorrow. You know, during the Vietnam War, uh, one of the young ladies in my classes came in and she threw this little poem on my desk, and I want to share it with you. It's, she called it, Things You Didn't Do. And she says this, Remember the day I borrowed your brand new car and I dented it? I thought you'd kill me, but you didn't. And the time I dragged you to the beach and you said it would, it would rain and it did, I thought you'd say I told you so, but you didn't. And the time I flirted with all the guys to make you jealous and you were, I thought you'd leave me, but you didn't. And do you remember the time I spilled blueberry pie all over your brand new car rug? I thought you'd smack me, but you didn't. And the time I forgot to tell you that the dance was formal and you showed up in jeans. I thought you'd leave me forever, but you didn't. Yes, there were lots of things you didn't do, but you put up with me and you, lo and you loved me and protected me. And there were so many things I wanted to make up to you when you got back from Vietnam, but you didn't. Go ahead and put it off. Go ahead and wait for tomorrow. If there's something that needs to be done, you do it now, because tomorrow may never be there. And especially is that true in human relationships. Don't wait. The time for life is now. The time for love is now. The time to do is now. Not tomorrow. And another thing that keeps us from experiencing this big, wondrous thing called communication with other people is our fear of choice. You know, I fully believe that all of life is a choice. Joy is a choice, and so is despair. Laughter is a choice, and so are tears. Nobody can put you on a downer if you don't want to go there. So stop blaming others for affecting your life and saying, they're putting me down all the time. Nobody can put you down. Only you can put yourself down. So take full responsibility for wherever you are. If you're crying, take responsibility for your tears and stop blaming me or society or your husband or your wife or God or your business. You take full responsibility and see the difference. Learn that you are controlling your life. And you can certainly learn it through pain as well as joy. When I was 16, I had an uncle. Everyone should have an Uncle Louie. And Uncle Louie was so nice because he left a little bit of money to all the little bambini of the Buscaglia family. And he said that they were to celebrate it in joy. And so I said, I want to use my money to go to Paris. Mama says, if you go, you are declaring yourself an adult. And don't come to Mama with tears in your eyes. Well, you know, I went to Paris. You can imagine, 16-year-old in, in the Paris of Jean Paul Sartre. I got a little Garrett apartment right out of an opera. I could see all of the skyline of Paris. I used to buy the wonderful crispy bread and camembert cheese. Oh, I was in my glory. You know, and pretty soon, my money was disappearing. And I didn't have any more. It was all going out. Nothing was coming in. I hadn't learned yet about all these things. Pity. Uh, and so I thought, well, now I don't have much money. And I, I have to make, make something happen. So I'll tell Mama. And I wrote a telegram home. And to save money, it was a single word telegram. I still have it. 
if you don't believe it. I said, dear mama, you know, starving, Felice. 24 hours later, I had an answer from mama. Starve, mama. <laughs> the moment of truth. Boy, did I learn through pain. I learned what hunger was. I learned what cold was. I learned what it meant to have friends that were superficial. I learned all of those things because a brave person in my life said, Starve. To reach out to another is to risk involvement. But you know, if you don't have involvement, the alternative is loneliness and despair. Is that what you want? Sure, you may get your hand slapped. But this is a strong thing, this hand. Put it out again. But don't be afraid. To expose your feelings is to risk exposing yourself. And that's all I've got. I'm always exposed. But you see here, you're going to see any time you see Buscaglia walking down the campus. I'm one of those weirdos that say hello to everybody. I sometimes I get very strange responses. You know, hello. And generally people say hello, but they look at me, you know, who's he? And sometimes I get people who say, do I know you? And I say, no, but wouldn't it be fun? And they might say, no, it, no, it wouldn't. And that's okay, you know. Because if you're going to be going out saying hello, then you've got to be able to accept whatever ramifications come. And have great defense mechanisms, I say as I walk away, hurt, like other human beings. What a shame they don't want to know me, because I'm nice. And if they knew me, they would like me and take me in. So I'm going to give them another chance. And when I see him the next day, you know, I run across the campus. I say, hi, do I know you? Yes, we met yesterday. <laughs> to place your ideas and dreams before the crowd is to risk ridicule. Well, you know, you have a right to your dreams and your ideas. Risks must be taken because the greatest risk in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, and is nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow and pain, but he simply cannot learn to feel and to grow and to live and to love. Only the person who takes risks is truly free. And that's the truth. We've got to make ourselves vulnerable again. We're afraid to be, lo to be lovers. We've got to be able to state it and not to be ashamed of it. To let people know that we truly and genuinely care about them and that they're more important to us always than things. Learn to listen to people again. You know, so often we are so wise that we already have the next line of dialogue before the person we're talking to has ever even finished what they've said. We haven't even listened to them. We haven't heard them. We don't look at anybody. That's what's called being treated like an it. Nobody looks at you anymore. Nobody really listens to you anymore. And heaven forbid nobody touches you anymore. You know, the Buscalias were great huggers. And that's continued in a very natural way to my present state of living. I always tell my students now, when you come and see me in my office, I'm going to hug you. And if that bothers you, take your tranquilizer. Because I don't believe you until I do. You know, we're one of the few cultures left that still stand the way Emily Post tells us to and extend our hands and say, how do you do? Talk about a distancing phenomenon. How do you do? You know, try how do you do sometime. It makes a tremendous difference. You become real. And if you can't handle it with strangers, try it out again in your own family. I'm the only person in the School of Education that hugs the dean. <laughs> Nobody hugs that poor man. He's behind this enormous desk, you know. And I remember the first time I did it, I was sitting there and he was saying these beautiful things, things. And I was growing in his presence and I wanted to thank I said, you know, you are remarkable. And I went around the table and he's on one of those swivel chairs. And he's going, ah, ah. You know, and I throw my arms around him. And then I was consistent because every time I see him, I hug him. And now I know he likes it because he cuddles. cuddles. <laughs> you know, and, and another thing, you're not going to break your face by, by smiling at people. And you know, that seems almost naive. But I say to people, how are you today? And they say, fine. And I think, well, why the hell don't you tell your face? <laughs> I'm not going to approach you looking like a rock of Gibraltar. Show me you're approachable. Pay compliments. We've forgotten how to accept them. And we really are fearful of paying them. 
I never have any difficulty paying honest compliments. Just look around you. You know, you have a beautiful face. You have wonderful eyes. You're a very gentle man. I've noticed I haven't disappeared or fallen to pieces. You know, I was in Arizona and we saw this, this greasy spoon was what it looked like and it smelled like it when you got in. And I said to the girl, what's your specialty? You know, what did I know? And she said, our pork chops. And I thought, oh God, you know, that's going to finish me off forever. But I thought, what the hell, let's live dangerously. I'll order the pork chop. Well, you know, they came to me and they were gorgeous. I never saw anything like them. They were huge and they were done just like I love them. And so I ate these pork chops, and after I finished, I called her over, and I said, those were fantastic. Well, you know, she was amazed. And I said, I'd like to compliment the chef. She said, what? I said, yes, I'd really like to let him know. So she said, well, well, okay, but that's never been done before. I said, Gee, would he mind? And she said, no. So she went back, and this great huge guy with tattoos, you know, with this greasy apron came out, and he said, what do you want? You know, and I said, these are the best pork chops and I've eaten in the best gourmet restaurants in the world in Paris in, in Rome in New York in Los Angeles and I've never tasted things like that you know this guy was so taken aback and he said uh, oh you want another one <laughs> you know we're so, we're so frail a little bit of kindness goes so far let's not forget how vulnerable people are it makes a big difference. Love is easy. We're the ones that are so complex. Communication is easy. We're the ones that confuse it and make it static. I'm going to close with something that I love. It's, uh, at a hospice meeting, uh, people who were dying were asked to write a little essay. If I had my life to live over again, how would you live it? And this is written by an 85-year-old man who was dying of cancer. And it's really beautiful. It's not a downer. It's really an upper. But we see ourselves in it so beautifully. He said, if I had my life to live over again, I'd not be afraid of more mistakes next time. In fact, I'd relax a lot more. I'd limber up. I'd be sillier than I'd been on this trip. In fact, I know of very few things that I would take so seriously. I'd take more chances. I'd take more trips. I'd climb more mountains. I'd swim more rivers. I'd sit and watch more sunsets. I'd go more places I'd never been before. I'd eat more ice cream and fewer beans. I'd have more actual troubles and fewer imaginary ones. You know, 90% of what we worry about never happens anyway. And yet we worry and we worry and we worry and we worry. Worry when it's there. Do something about it creative when it's there. But to sit months in advance worrying about what isn't going to happen. What a waste of time. What a horrible thing to do to your colon. You see, I was one of those people that lived prophylactically and sanely and sensibly, hour after hour and day after day. Oh, I've had my moments. And if I had it to live all over again, I'd try to have more of those moments. In fact, I'd try to have nothing else but wonderful moments side by side by side by side instead of living so many years ahead of my time I was one of those people who never went anywhere without a thermometer, a hot water bottle, a gargle, a raincoat and a parachute if I had it to do all over again I'd travel lighter next time what an incredible thing if I had my life to live over again I'd play with more children I'd pick more daisies I'd love more if I had my life to live over again. But you see, I don't. We're given one. There was a wonderful statement in the Washington Post that I love. It says, no one will ever get out of this life alive. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Remember it. Keep it in the back of your mind. Stand up and make your statement. Unless you take the first step, you're never going to get anywhere. The time for action is now, and only you can make the difference. And you can extend yourself a little and see what happens. Whisk a little and see what happens. You can make things change. You can make things happen.
that you never thought you could. But you know, there's an old saying that says, to be is to do. And I add to that. And to do is to be now. Because tomorrow may not be here. Thank you for being such a beautiful audience.